former Fort Worth police officer who shot and killed Atiana Jefferson, Aaron Dean, took the witness stand today. He was the first uh, witness the defense called uh, in his murder trial. Uh, this is what uh, he said today uh, while he, exp he was asked why he waived his Fifth Amendment rights. Uh, this is, he said the jury needs to hear from me and hear the truth. Yes. As I looked through that window, low in the window, I observed a person. Couldn't tell black, white, male, female. I saw uh, the torso horizontal, bent over horizontal and could see about this much up on the arm and then about the same uh, on the leg, just the upper, upper leg to the hip. And uh, the upper arms, I could tell there was movement, like the upper arms were moving, like someone was reaching for something or grasping. This torso is silhouette. Is it okay to use silhouette? Silhouette, yes. Were they near the window or away from the window based on what you can see at the time? Uh, very close to the window. You've seen your video. Yes. Are you able to see into the room where the camera cannot? Yes. When you see this silhouette of a torso, would you say it is an adult torso or a female <coughs> torso? It was an adult torso. Aaron, when you see that adult torso at the window, what do you do? Well, I thought we had a had a burger, so I uh, stepped back, straightened up, and drew my uh, weapon, and then pointed it uh, towards the figure. I couldn't see that person's hands, and we're taught that uh, the hands and it's what's in them that kill. But we need to we need to see the hands. We need to get people to show us our hands and get control of those hands. So I uh, drew my weapon, intending to tell that person to show me their hands. Well, as I said, I, I needed to see that person's hands because the hands carry weapons. The hands are, are the threat to us. So I looked back uh, after I got my light on, saw the silhouette again, and I was shouting at this time, shouting commands, uh, put up your hands, show me your hands, show me your hands. And as I started to get that second phrase out, show me your hands. I saw the silhouette. I was looking right down the barrel of a gun. And when I saw the barrel of that gun pointed at me, and I fired a single shot from my duty weapon. And immediately had the the flash from the muzzle reflecting off the off the window. And of course, uh, as my weapon recoiled, the light was bouncing back in my face, so I couldn't see. Uh, when my vision cleared, then I observed the person <laughs> that we now know as Ms. Jefferson. I heard her scream and, and saw her fall like this. And I, I knew that, that I'd shot that person. Aaron, when you first picked up this firearm pointed at you, how close to the window were you? Picked up, you mean saw? Yes. Visually picked up. Very close. Um, not any more than arm's length. This may be an obvious question, but I need to ask you. See the weapon? Is it in the silhouette's hand? What do you see? I just saw the silhouette of the person and the gun. I don't recall seeing hands, but I, I did see that weapon pointed at me. <laughs> 
Legal analyst Candace Kelly joins us right now. Candace, glad to have you uh, right here on Roller Martin Unfiltered. Look, here's an officer uh, who hmm. is trying to save his hide, obviously. The fact of the matter is his own partner testified hmm. she never saw a gun. She never heard him uh, introduce himself as a police officer. Uh, look. You don't have, you know, it's not like you have a diverse jury here, uh, but he had no choice but to take the witness stand after that devastating testimony last week from his own partner. Absolutely, Roland. And I think what's key is what you said, is that he is someone who did not follow police protocol. We even had the former chief of police uh, say such, that he did not de-escalate, that he did not say who he was. And even when he did say, as you said, hey, raise your hand, he didn't even give Atiana, enough time to actually do anything in terms of revert or say who she was. He just said, put your hands up, and then he shot. She only had a split second to do anything if she was allowed to do anything and if she was able to do anything, but it just was not enough time. His uh, partner who took the stand was a really crucial time period in this whole case, which it wasn't a very long case. We were, he, you know, the prosecution only took two and a half days to really try to make their case. But what she did was she established the fact that they did not do what he was supposed to do. And then he got on the stand today for most of the day, and then he co-signed on that fact. At every single turn, the prosecution pounced on him and asked him, was this good police procedure? Was this good policing? And every single time, almost, he said, this was just bad policing. This was just not the way to do it. So it was very interesting to see him want to get on the stand, tell the truth, but the truth is something that led him to some waters that were very, very dirty, Roland. And, I, and you know, you train your client to get on the stand, you train your client to go through cross-examination, but I don't think that they would have expected that he would do this. And at the end of the day, he didn't show a lot of contrition. This is what people who are part of the jury like to see. They like to see that someone is remorseful. He said that would he right. do it all over again? He said that he would. So, and none of this really kind of worked out the way I think that he thought it would in terms of him telling his truth. Wait, 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 wait. He literally sat there and said, yeah, I didn't follow proper police protocol and I would do it again? That's right. And gave himself the grade of a B. Dude, dude, fall, how dude fall, fall on your sword. Yeah. Yeah, this, you know, I, I think it's just one of those things where, as you said, you know, he had to establish a couple of things. One, that he feared for his life. Two, that he saw this gun being directed at him, even though his partners, you know, said that she didn't say it because her back was perhaps, um, uh, you know, to the house. But here's what was interesting that stood out. Even though he said he saw a gun, when his partner went into the house, he didn't announce, hey, listen, I see a gun. So before you go in there, you know, I need to warn you. This is when the prosecution asked, well, do you even like your partner? Because when she went to the house and you claim you saw a gun, you didn't warn her about the fact in your head that somebody did have a gun that was shooting right at you. So it's so many different turns. He got which himself is what caught cop, up. Which is what cops normally do. That's right. Which is what cops normally do. I mean, you're warning your partner. Look, I, I, look, at the end of the day, and here's the other deal, Candace. I'm born and raised in Texas. You can have a gun in your own house. That's right. You can have a gun in your own house, which should which should have put them, uh, you know, on a different level of understanding how people are going to act when they are in their own house. Um, you know, he spent the whole day just not making sense. Um, and I don't think that when it comes for him, you know, setting out to do what he intended to do, that that was accomplished at all. Um, this is a, a look. We, we see this all the time the actions these police officers make and the impact they have. And people say, all oh, their split second decisions. This is a perfect example where you didn't even have to go inside. It was a wellness check about a door being open. It was. Now he claims on the stand that he thought that this was a, a, a burglar, uh, a burglary that was in the process because the doors were open. Things seem kind of ransacked, uh, but again, when we're talking about police protocol, he did not follow it. He didn't. 
did not help. He acted unprofessional, according to the former police chief. And this is, you know, this was a case that came right after the Amber Geiger case. So this was already a community that was really fueled up already in terms of what was happening in the police force. Over that past previous six months, five people had been killed by the police. So this was a community that was on alert and police who were on alert, too, that everybody needs to play their role. And even with that, this is someone who went in and did the complete opposite of his training. And again, the prosecution got him to admit that on the stand. But what he wanted to do, and this is why he wanted to get on the stand, and this is the takeaway, was to prove that he felt that his life was in, that he was in fear, that he was in fear of bodily harm. And so that's why he had to est establish that gun in his face. Now, if you look at the video camera, and this is the second person who took the stand as someone who was a, a video analyst, they said, you know, there's really no way to really tell. So that's why this is all going to be in the hands of the jury. It really is kind of a he said, and then the, from the grave, a she said, as well as her nephew, Zion, who took the stand. At the time this happened, he was eight years old, 11 years old. He testified yesterday and said that his aunt had the gun down by her side and did not have it in front of that window. Now, years ago, he did say that she did have the gun pointed. So I think that's going to be neither here nor there. Again, it is in the jury's hands. It's going to be eight men, six, uh, six women, who are going to decide the fate of this officer. Now, there are no blacks who were on this jury. I understand there are about three to four who might be people of color, Indians, uh, um, Latinos. But this is where our civic duty really rolling comes into place. If you get those paperwork in the mail, you take your civic duty and you make sure that you get on that jury because these are the people who matter ultimately and will probably be into the jury's hands by next week. Candace Kelly, a legal analyst, we certainly appreciate you joining us. Thanks a lot. All right, Roland, good to see you. All right, folks, back to our Roland Mark unfiltered video in just one moment. When you talk about blackness, and what happens in black culture. We're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. 